So for the last month or so, we've been in this series called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And, and we've been putting aside the Bible as our source of authority, which again is very hard for me as a Bible teacher. But we've been going more into science and whatnot. We've been looking at um, evidence for the existence of God. Because in an increasing uh, culture where, where atheism is on the rise and agnosticism and spiritual skepticism in, in whole is claiming many within you know, the, 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 the millennial generation, many are just kind of giving up on God because maybe... I believe science says that there is no God or I can't believe in God and numbers are saying that this is on the rise. This is a great conversation to have. What does it take to be an atheist or a spiritual skeptic? And and we've been saying from the very beginning that whatever my worldview is, whether atheist or agnostic or Christian or Buddhist or Jewish, that I'm making truth claims. Either God exists or God doesn't exist. That Jesus was the son of God or, or he wasn't or he never even existed. I'm making truth claims about the past that really... And we're dealing in the realm of probability, not certainty. We can't be certain about any of these things, whether God exists or God doesn't exist, or Jesus was the Son of God, or he rose from the dead, or he didn't. That we're dealing in the realm of probability. And so because we're dealing in the realm of probability, all of us have to have faith in whatever our truth claim is, whether atheist or agnostic. And so to say I'm not a person of faith really doesn't apply, because we all have to have faith, whatever it is we say, We believe in. But what we've seen is that the more evidence I have for my truth claim, the less faith I need. The more evidence there is for my truth claim, the less faith that I need. And the less evidence that there is for my truth claim, the more faith that I need. And what we've been looking at, as we've been looking at um, evidence for the existence of God over these last several weeks, as as we've looked at the cosmological argument that the universe clearly has a beginning and the first law of science is the laws of, uh, law of causality, that all things that have a beginning have to have a cause outside of themselves. Therefore, there must be a God. As we looked at the, the argument of teleology, uh, the teleological argument that says that the universe is so finely tuned against all odds, improbable odds, statistically impossible odds, that all of these, these, these constants in our universe would allow life to take place on a little speck of dust called Earth. It's beyond imagination that that could happen by chance. We looked at the, the, the argument of creation. Where did life come from? We looked at Darwinism. We said Darwin didn't even attempt to answer the question of where the first life came from, just how we have complexity and variety in life from that first life. But where did that first life come from? How could it happen by chance? We looked at the odds and the probability of that, and we saw that it takes a lot of faith to believe all of these things happen simply by chance. But that God must be, because we have a universe, because we have a finely tuned universe, because we have life. We've been using a book called uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist as as one of the sources from which we're gathering this information, and I've been highly recommending it. But today, we're going to spend our last week on evidence for God's existence, and we're moving away from the realm of science today and into the world of philosophy. Some of you will be excited about that. Others of you are going to roll your eyes. You remember philosophy class from college, and you don't remember much about it other than it was boring. But hopefully we're going to be able to get through this together as we consider the question, is God necessary for morality? Is God necessary for good? In the book, Words We Live By, Brian Burrell tells the story of Dennis Lee Curtis, who was an armed robber who was captured in uh, Grand Rapids, South Dakota. And in... The, the police found in his wallet a, a list uh, with, I said Grand Rapids, South Dakota, Rapid City, South Dakota, excuse me. In uh, his wallet, the police found a list with the following code of conduct for this armed robber who was caught in the act. Number one, I will not kill anyone unless I have to. That's good. Number two, I will take cash and food stamps, no checks. Number three, I will rob only at night. Number four, I will not wear a mask. He wants to be seen by those he's robbing, apparently. Number five, I will not rob mini markets or 7-Eleven stores. Number six, if I get chased by cops on foot, I will get away. If chased by a vehicle, I will not put the lives of innocent civilians on the line. Number seven, I will only rob seven months out of the year. Just kind of get a sense that's probably, maybe it started at three, then went to six, and then seven, you know, just as need requires. I don't know, number eight. I will enjoy robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. This is a, an armed robber who was breaking the law but had this, this sense of morality about him. He had his own moral code of what was right and what was wrong. And where did that moral code come from? 
Was it something outside of himself, some objective North Star standard that said these things are always right and these things are always wrong? No, as you look at where he got this, this, this moral code, apparently it came from his own idea of morality. He did what was right in his own mind. And really, what this robber did was a reflection of the culture in which we live. We live in a culture in which we all seem to do what is right in our own mind. We have our own moral code based on what we think is right or wrong. And this is because we live in a culture that to a very a uh, large degree has learned to value this ideology called moral relativism. Moral relativism is a belief that there is no absolutely right or wrong, good or evil thing for all times and all people universally, but that right and wrong, good and evil, are more a matter of preference. It's a matter of the times. It's a matter of situations. It's a matter of you know, what your preference is. Is, but there is not any kind of absolute right or wrong. It's personal choice. What's right for me is right for me. What's right for you is right for you. But don't try to impose what you think is right for you on me because it's all just relative, right? There's no absolute moral code that determines what is good, what is bad, what is right, and what is wrong. We see expressions of this moral relativism in our culture anywhere um, that we look even within ourselves. If you have ever found yourself asking yourself, is this right or wrong, by considering the question, well, will it hurt anybody? And if it doesn't hurt anybody, then it's good. And if it hurts somebody, it's bad. You are a product of moral relativism. Because where did that come from? This, this, This code that, well, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's okay. I agree we shouldn't hurt people, but where does that come from? We are doing what is right in our own mind. There's no objective standard out there that says, that that's what we should live by. Or if you think to yourself, I will cheat on my taxes and rob from the IRS because everyone else does it and because no one likes the IRS, but I'm not going to rob from mini markets and 7-Elevens, you are a product of moral relativism. You are deciding in your own mind who you will rob from and who you won't. Right? We see moral relativism everywhere in our culture. The very fact that our schools require a signature from a parent for a nurse to give a student an aspirin or to go on a field trip, but yet a a child does not need a parent signature for an abortion, says that we live in a morally relativistic culture. We decide in our own minds what is right, what is wrong. The fact that teenagers today who are polled say that it is more uh, morally reprehensible to not recycle than to look at pornography, that is a product of moral relativism. It's better morally to look at pornography than not recycle. These are all products of what it means to live in a culture of moral relativism. There's no absolute right or wrong. We do what's right in our own minds. It's a matter of preference. The irony of living in a culture of moral relativism where we all say, you know, what's right for me is right for me, what's right for you is right for you, is this strange dynamic that we see all the time is that we're a culture passionate to identify and uncover and stamp out any form of inequality or any, any to- intolerance or injustice. But the question is why? What leads us to do that? And I agree we should do that to, to a large degree, but why do we do that? Why do we look at stamping out injustice or inequality or intolerance when what is right for me is right for me and what is wrong for you is wrong for you or right for you is right for you and it's all a matter of preference? Is intolerance a matter of preference? Is it okay for me to be intolerant because it's right for me, but you to be intolerant because that's right for you? I mean, really the bottom line is how do we justify being intolerant of intolerance? if it's all just a matter of preference. I hope you're following me. I'm going to keep saying the same thing again and again just to make sure that you're following me, okay? But I believe the fact of the matter is the reason we live in a culture that's trying to stamp out injustice and inequality and and intolerance is because deep inside of all of us is this universal moral code written on our hearts that tells us what is right and what is wrong, that we all know intuitively that some things are always wrong. Some things are always right in all circumstances. We know this, and this takes us to the moral argument for God. The moral argument for God goes something like this, and there's different versions of it, but number one, if God does not exist, if there is no God, objective moral values and duties do not exist. In other words, if there is no God, if the atheist is right, then moral relativism is the correct outcome. 
Because if there is no God, then there is no objective standard for what is right, what is wrong. There is no North Star to say this is good and this is evil. There's nothing outside of ourselves. It is all a matter of preference. In other words, to put this bluntly, if God does not exist, what Hitler did is simply a matter of preference. Okay? Number two, objective moral values and duties do exist. That's, that's premise number two. That I'm going to try to demonstrate today that, that they do exist. There is absolute, universal right and wrong, good and bad for all time. There is a moral code and, and, and that, that, that is inside all of us. And if that is true, if there is even one morally binding um, good or bad thing in all of the universe, whether it is bad to torture babies or it is bad to, to walk into a first grade class with a rifle and start shooting first graders, if that's always bad, if there's even one thing that is always morally bad or always morally good, then there must be a God. And that's the third point. Therefore, God exists. Is this true? Let me, let's, let's just kind of unpack this a little bit. Start with the first point. Is God necessary for morality? This is a question that's been debated for thousands of years. Philosophers going back to Plato and Aristotle debated this question. Is God necessary for good? Do we need a God for morality? Let's be clear what we're not saying or what we're not asking. We're not saying or asking, is belief in God necessary for morality? Because clearly the answer to that is no. You don't need to believe in God in order to be a moral person. We've all probably met the atheist who is a highly moral person. Maybe you're sitting here today, highly moral person, even though there's no belief in God. We've maybe even met atheists who have a higher moral code than some Christ, professed Christians than we've known, right? Belief in God is not necessary for morality, nor is belief in God necessary for belief in morality. Lots of people who don't believe in God believe in a moral code and believe that it can even be objective, and we'll kind of return to that in, in a little bit, but... Let's be clear what we're not saying. The, the real question is, can there be an objective source of good and bad, right and wrong, without God? And I believe the answer to that question is no. But I would say the question depends on what we mean by morality. You know, if, if by a moral code we meet a pattern of social behavior that we all just kind of agree to as a society, which is what we, we, we're always doing, um, kind of this moral relativism idea that we all agree killing is bad, we all believe rape is bad, you know, we all believe intolerance is bad, we all agree to that. If that's what we're talking about by a moral code, then no, God is not necessary for that, right? And that's happening all the time. Cultures are always making their own form of morality, and that could be a good thing. And that's, God's not necessary for that. But if by morality we mean that certain things, again, are always good, really good, Certain things are always evil, really evil, universally for all people of all time, then God is indeed necessary for that kind of morality. Because otherwise, who is it that's saying what is good and what is bad? Who is it that's making that determination? It would have to be someone outside of us. And if there is no God, then moral statements like murder is evil, racism is wrong, you shouldn't abuse children, they have no objective meaning, they're just preference just someone's opinion, like strawberry tastes better than chocolate. But I think we know that issues like morale, or murder, uh, racism, the abuse of children is more than just personal opinion. God wills morality because God is a moral and good being. So my premise is, yes, we do need God in order to have any type of objective morality. So what evidence is there for this, for the moral argument? that we need God for morality? What evidence is there that there is a moral code? Well, first of all, consider with me uh, just the irrationality of moral relativism. This, this counter idea of moral relativism is, is really irrational, which means that all of us are functioning in irrationality to some degree. Um, people say with absolute confidence, with absolute confidence, there is no absolute truth. Can you see how that is just a self-defeating statement? Right from the very beginning. I absolutely believe that it is true, that there is no absolute truth. That is a self-defeating statement. You're saying absolutely that there's no absolute truth, which means there is at least one absolute truth, that there is no absolute truth. Or what's true for you is true for me, or you and not for me. Well, is that only true for you? Is relativism only true for me, and I could have absolute truth? And are they both true? Um, 
in the same way, moral relativism is kind of a contradiction in, of terms. How can we, on the one hand, say that morality is, is relative, yet at the same time try to fight for any kind of uh, uh, prejudice or against intolerance or inequality in our culture? How can we have it both ways? If there is no universal truth, good or bad, then if truth is relative, then who's to say it's wrong to be intolerant or unjust? Is that a truth that is only true for you and not for me? So you need to be tolerant, but I don't. But we can know that even moral relativists believe in a universal moral law. And, and, but we don't, we, we don't see that by how a moral relativist explains their beliefs, but rather looking at how a moral relative, relativist acts when you step on their rights as humans or treat them unfairly. If you want to know what a person really believes about absolute values and rights, don't look at what they say. Look at how they act when you take away their rights or their freedom or you abuse their sense of justice. In their book, Geisler and Turek tell the story of a professor of a major university in Indiana. He was teaching a class on ethics. And so he gave a term paper to his students and he allowed them to write about anything they wanted to write about and gave all the parameters for the paper. And uh, one student who was an atheist decided to write on this topic of moral relativism. And in his paper, he wrote about all the things like all morals are relative. There is no absolute standard of justice or rightness. It's all a matter of opinion and preference. You like chocolate. I like vanilla. And he went on and on. And the paper was well written. Uh, it was well researched and documented. It was the right length. It was turned in on time. It was even presented in a, a beautiful blue folder. Well, the professor of ethics got the paper back, read the paper, and when he was done reading the paper, he promptly wrote on the front of it, F, I don't like blue folders. Well, the student gets the paper back, and obviously he is outraged at the injustice of what has just happened. And so he bursts into the professor's office, and he says, F, I don't like blue folders. That's not fair. That's not right. That's not just. You didn't judge my paper on the, the basis of its merits. And the, the professor put up his hand. He slowed, calmed the, the student down. He says, slow down. I've, I read a lot of papers. Now, wasn't your the paper on moral relativism that said there is no sense of justice or it's all just a matter of, of preference and, and there is no fairness in, in, in the world? And the student said, well, yes, that's true. And he said, yeah, didn't you go on to say that it's just you like chocolate, I like vanilla, it's just a matter of taste? Yeah, that's the way I feel about things. And the professor said, fine, I don't like blue. You get an F. <laughs> now, finally, the light went on for the student, and he realized he really did believe in moral absolutes. At least he believed that there was absolutely this idea of injustice because he felt he was being treated unjustly with the professor giving him an F just over the color of his folder. And the moral of the story is there are absolute morals. And if you really want to get a relativist to admit it, all you need to do is treat them unfairly. And we could all probably relate to that. You know, maybe not in these cases, but, you know, we could talk about stealing being, oh, you know, stealing is relative, and I feel stealing is okay when I'm stealing from you, but when you steal from me, it's a completely different story. Or I could talk about adultery, oh, adultery is fine, so this is up to the choice of a couple. Until my wife commits adultery, then all of a sudden it's a very, very different story. Said another way, and this is a quote from uh, Turek and Geisler, they say the moral law is not always the standard by which we treat others but it is nearly always the standard by which we expect others to treat us. Moral relativism is irrational. Another way to know the moral code exists is if it doesn't exist, how can we judge one act as good or righteous or pure and another as evil or bad? Let's pit Mother Teresa against Hitler. How do we know that what Mother Teresa did in her life is morally better than what Hitler did with his. Hitler liked to kill people. Mother Teresa liked to help people. How do we know, objectively, which is good, which is bad, what is right, what is wrong? Or is it just a matter of opinion? This may sound ridiculous, but if it's true there is no moral objective law, this is where we find ourselves. In a universe without God, in a world where humans are just the product of natural selection, of Darwinism, just a chance that occurred, 
There is no objective moral law. It's all a matter of opinion. If there is no moral law, then there will be nothing objectively wrong with Nazis exterminating Jews or Muslim extremists flying planes filled with innocent people into the sides of of buildings or any other form of violence or injustice. If we're really just the product of natural selection, according to Darwin, just evolved from one single-cell organism just through a series of natural selection, survival of the fittest, then what Hitler, Hitler did was he was actually the one acting in harmony with nature and in alignment with Darwinism. In fact, he quoted Darwin in order to justify the extermination of Jews in his book, Mein Kampf. He wrote that this is why we can do what we're about to do. Just consider what he said. He said, If nature does not wish that weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one. Because in such cases, all her, nature's efforts, throughout hundreds of thousands of years to establish an evolutionary higher stage of being may thus be rendered futile. But such a preservation goes hand in hand with the inexorable law that it is the strongest and the best who must triumph and that they have the right to endure. He who would live must love, show compassion, you know, be self-sacrificing. No, he must fight. He who does not wish to fight in this world where permanent struggle is the law of life, according to Darwin, has not the right to exist. Hitler was actually acting in a way that was in alignment with Darwinism and naturalism. Mother Teresa, on the other hand, was acting in a way contrary to Darwin's theory of the survival of the fittest and self-preservation because she was giving herself away sacrificially so that weaker species could actually experience a bit of comfort in their quite miserable lives. Hitler killed people, Mother Teresa helped people. If there is no moral law, on what basis can we argue one person's actions are morally superior to others? What is the standard? Now, I know that many smart and moral atheists and moral relativists will say we do have an objective standard, and I've been listening to many of those arguments and and trying to understand them. But one of the most common arguments is that right and wrong, good and bad, is based on, again, what will hurt people and what will help people. That if I do something to help people, then that is good. And if I do something to hurt people, then that is bad. And again, I agree with that. That's a great code. But why? How do we justify that? Where does it come from? Why should we be helpful to other people? Again, especially when we are the product of survival of the fittest. What sense would that make in an evolutionary process? Why should we not hurt other people? I mean, animals, think about this. If we are the product of an evolutionary kind of um, survival of the fittest and, and chance, then we are only more highly evolved animals. We just have a bigger frontal lobe. We've got a few more advantages, the opposable thumb and all of that. There is no morality in the animal kingdom. When a lion kills an antelope, it is not doing something evil or bad. No one would say that. It's just doing what lions do. It does what animals do. So why is it different with humans? What makes humans different? To what do we point? Now, for a Christian... Or a theist, we would say, well, we are made in the image of God. God made us like it. He made us special. Therefore, we have special um, um, responsibilities to creation. We have special responsibilities to one another, to honor one another. That The fact of, of, that God loves us and values us means we love and value one another. That Jesus would say that uh, you, we're to love not only our neighbors but our enemies. I mean, these are the kind of things that we would point to outside of ourselves because this we believe that these voices are from our creator, we would say that is why we are moral. That is why we love one another. That's why we're self-sacrificing. That's why we lay down our lives for one another in many, many cases. But how do we justify these moral claims if there is no God, if we don't have those voices? Why aren't they relative? Why aren't they true for you and not for me? You like helping people. I like hurting people. It's all morally relative. Or another argument that atheists and more relativists will make is the social contract theory. Just that 
you know, we all together as a society come together and we agree on what is moral and what is immoral, what is good, what is bad, and we all kind of just uh, informally sign this contract when we're born into the race, and if we're not kind of living according to that, we get punished, but it's all just kind of what society decides is, is right and what is wrong. So certainly this happens, again, Cultures do this all the time. There are certain things that we do that we would think are right and wrong that other cultures may not think as big a deal about. But does the fact that we as a culture say those things are right or wrong make them objectively wrong universally or right universally? And clearly the answer to that is no. Again, just going back to Nazi Germany, there was a social contract in place that said killing innocent Jews because they're Jewish is okay. And the majority of, of society signed off on that and said it was okay. Did that make it okay? Certainly not. Or if, if the Nazis had won the war, and if they had gone on to kill or you know, convert all of their enemies, and now all of a sudden everyone on the planet was buying into this social contract theory, and there were death camps everywhere, would that then make killing innocent people, right, because the majority of the people left on the planet agreed on it. And I think we would all say, of course, no. What is it in us that would fight against that and say, no, that just would not be right? Why, I mean, why is it we know that flying planes filled with innocent people in the buildings is categorically wrong or stepping into a classroom full of first graders and starting to shoot them is just always evil? These actions are more than just breaches in some imaginary social contract. So how do we know? I believe the Bible is right. When the Bible writes in the book of Romans, it says, Indeed, when Gentiles, and a Gentile in this case would be somebody who didn't grow up reading the Bible or knowing God. They kind of grew up in a very different um, worldview apart from God. When Gentiles who do not have the law or the scriptures or this moral law, when they don't have it, they never read it, but when they do, by nature, just naturally, things required by God, by the law, they are a law for themselves. In other words, they're showing that the law exists. Even though they do not have the law, they've never read it, since they show that the requirements of the law, this moral code, are written on their hearts. The Bible is saying all of us have this sense of good and bad and right and wrong written on us, and there's clearly evidence for a moral law that is universal. C.S. Lewis so brilliantly wrote like this. He said, think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, or where a man felt proud to double-cross all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. I mean, we just know that there are some things that are right, some things that are wrong, good and bad, evil, in all places, in all time. This is such an important topic. You may think that this is just philosophy, but this is such an important topic. How we decide on whether there really is a moral code or whether it's all relative, whether there is a God, whether there's not. Because what we believe about these things have deep implications for how we live and how we treat one another and how we run our society. Just think about this. Let me use some extreme examples. Many Darwinists have taken the theory of, of Darwinism and naturalism and survival of the fittest to very extreme but somewhat logical conclusions. For instance, Princeton professor uh, and Darwinist Peter Singer has used Darwinist to teach and write about infanticide. He believes that parents should be able to kill their infants up to the age of 28 days. He says that a newborn infant is lower on the kind of evolutionary scale than a pig or a dog. And so you should be able to kill your children up to 28 years old. Now, uh, 28 days old. Now, it, to that I would say, <laughs> how do you come up with 28 days? I mean, where, where does that number come from? It's all relative. So why not 28 months or why not 28 years, right? If there is no moral law or moral law giver, there is nothing wrong with murder at any age. It's just a matter of opinion. Or... Another Darwinist, or two of them, Randy Thornhill and Craig Palmer, they wrote a book asserting that rape is a natural consequence of evolution. It's just, that's just who we are. It's how we got to where we are, and it's going to be around. I mean, just, just accept it. Now, I know that most Darwinists, most atheists do not think in these kind of extreme um, ends. But my question would be, well, why not? What would you point to to justify that we shouldn't? use infanticide or rape? To what objective outside of us source could we use to justify that? 
if we have no one ultimately to answer to, or if there is no objective moral law, who is to say what is good and what is bad? What is the basis for the intrinsic value of human beings if there is no moral law? If we're only simply highly evolved animals? Or consider other implications of what we believe that are very, very important. Is it a coincidence that the 20th century, the century in which we killed more people, more people senselessly died than any other century, is it a coincidence that came just decades after the theory of evolution was developed and spread? Is it a coincidence that we just began to believe there is no God, that we're the products of chance, only highly evolved animals, and then we go on to kill more people in the 20th century than were killed in all the previous 19th centuries combined? I know that there has always been violence in the world, and there has even been violence in the name of God. And this leads many people to spiritual skepticism. If we look at the history of the world, and we see that many in the name of God, many in the name of Christ, have done violent things. And we point to things like the Inquisition and things like the Crusades. We're like, well, how could God be real? How could Christianity be right when there was violence in the name of it? But that the, we just need to see the two aren't connected. That would be like saying a math teacher who beats his, his students because they get their timetables wrong means that math doesn't exist or math is wrong. The two aren't connected. Yes, there were people who, out of alignment with the teachings of Christianity, used Christianity, people in power, to get more power and, and wielded, used violence in history. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist or Christianity is wrong. And while all violence is wrong, In comparison, what happened in the name of religion over the first 19 centuries of Earth's history pales in comparison to what happened in the 20th century in the name of Darwinism and naturalism. And if you look at the people who brought that violence and death in the 20th century, people like Hitler and Stalin and Lenin and Mao, who killed well over 100 million people, they were living out the natural ideology that they had embraced. Darwinism, survival of the fittest. What we believe matters. What happened in the 20th century is that we killed God and then we started killing one another. Or we wonder, why is there so much violence in our culture? Why so much gun violence in our schools? Is it because of the existence of guns? Maybe. Or maybe it's deeper than that. Maybe it's because we've been teaching our children for decades that there is no moral absolute truth or law. Maybe it's because there is no moral absolute lawgiver. We teach them that there's no difference between them and an animal. Therefore, they begin to treat themselves and, and one another like animals. What we believe matters. What we believe about God, what we believe about morality, all has very important implications. This is the moral argument. It says, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. If God doesn't exist, what Hitler did is simply a matter of preference. Moral objective, uh, objective moral values and duties do exist. And if that's true, if even one exists, one objective law exists, there must be a moral lawgiver. Therefore, God exists. This this is, I think, a really important argument to kind of end on in our kind of um, looking at evidence for the existence of God. It's not the most compelling when it comes to uh, evidence for the existence of God. You know, the teleological and the cosmological and the creation argument are much more compelling in terms of evidence for the existence of God. But this is so important because while the other arguments of God tell us so much about who God is— you know, the, 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 the cosmological argument tells us that he must be all-wise and immeasurably powerful and extremely intelligent. That, that creation tells us that he must be incredibly creative and, and diverse. It's the moral argument, more than any, that tells us what he must be like. And the moral argument shows us that God, this moral lawgiver, must be good. He must be moral. You see... God didn't give us arbitrary rules just to keep us in line or steal joy from our lives or just to test us to see if we would be obedient. He gave us laws that are a reflection of his very character. Our our moral values, things like honesty, integrity, compassion, self-sacrifice, kindness, goodness, generosity, all of these are outgrowths of the character and the nature 
of God, the one who created us. His commandments, treat others as you would want to be treated. Care for the weak, the orphans, and and the widows. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. They're all reflections of his nature. God is good, therefore we have a, a very good reason to be good as well. And he even promises us to give us the power to be like him if we'll only allow him. And so we have these two stories with these two radically different implications. Either God doesn't exist, and we're just a product of chance, and we can just keep keep on going on killing one another and killing ourselves. Or God does exist, and God is good, and he wants us to be good like him, and he wants us to lay down our our lives for one another and to be generous and self-sacrificing and compassionate. If for nothing else, which is the better story? The moral argument, again, while sound, it's not the end all. But I think together, combined with the cosmological argument that God created everything out of nothing, the the teleological argument that he aligned all things perfectly fine-tuned just to support life against all odds on this planet, the creation argument that life came from somewhere and was so beautifully designed in such depth and such intricacy, together with the moral argument, we could begin to see it is entirely reasonable to believe in the existence of God. As a matter of fact, I think it takes a whole lot less faith to believe there is an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving creator than it does to believe that all of life and all of matter and all of everything came from nothing. Again, I just don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to be a Darwinist. I don't have enough faith to be a moral relativist. 